On the early morning of September 22nd, 1914, three Royal Navy cruisers lingered a few miles off the coast of the Netherlands. The captains of these ships were aware of the existence of U-boats. However, blinded by the pride of the most dominant and esteemed naval force the world had ever witnessed, they largely dismissed the threat. Submarines were still in their infancy, seen as unreliable and somewhat experimental. They were dwarfed by dreadnoughts and plagued by their slow pace, limited range, technical malfunctions, and frequent need to surface, making them an easy target. But at 6 a.m., the tables began to turn. SMU-9, a modest 500-ton submarine armed with six torpedoes and commanded by Captain Lieutenant Otto Vedigan, set its sights on the cruisers. Although the ships had lookouts on the hunt for periscopes and man guns at the ready, Vedigan strategically positioned U-9 in their blind spot. In 90 minutes, the threat of the U-boat became a challenger to centuries of tradition and pride and brought naval warfare into the new century. When World War I began on July 28, 1914, the two dominant global navies, the British Royal Navy and the German Imperial Navy, revolved around their dreadnought and super-dreadnought battleships. Indeed, the escalating race to construct more dreadnoughts fueled tensions leading to the conflict. At the onset, alongside these colossal ships, the Royal Navy boasted 74 submarines, while the Imperial Navy had 20 U-boats. Neither navy truly respected the potential of the enemy's submarines, or even their own. This dismissal was especially prevalent in the Royal Navy. For centuries, the British Royal Navy had placed its pride and power in massive surface vessels, a deeply rooted tradition. The idea of a compact, submerged vessel dealing devastating blows to these behemoths seemed absurd. Traditional naval warfare honored ships engaging in combat after a formal challenge. Submarine warfare shattered this gentlemanly understanding. Given the Royal Navy's historical supremacy at sea, they displayed a stark overconfidence. German submarines had not yet showcased their capabilities. That moment, however, was imminent. SMU-9, the foremost of her U-9 class, was an Imperial German Navy submarine commissioned in April 1910. With its pressurized hull, this cylindrical vessel enabled the submarine to dive beneath the waves. The emergence of submarines as formidable warships necessitated novel crew accommodations and spatial arrangements. U-9 spanned 188 feet 3 inches, providing ample space for four officers and 31 enlisted men. On the surface, her paraffin engines emitted a noticeable trail of smoke and sparks, propelling her at a mere 14 knots. Submerged, however, she achieved speeds of just 8 knots. To fulfill her primary mission of sinking enemy vessels, the U-boat had four 20-inch torpedo tubes two in the bow and two astern, and housed six torpedoes. On July 16, 1914, mere days before the war's outbreak, U-9's crew achieved a groundbreaking feat, reloading her torpedo tubes while submerged, a first in naval history. Upon the war's commencement, Captain Lieutenant Otto Vedigan assumed U-9's helm. Soon after, he and his crew ventured into the English Channel, scouting for adversarial ships. In the war's opening month, German U-boats floundered, inflicting negligible harm. Yet on September 5th, U-boat SMU-21 changed the game, sinking HMS Pathfinder using a self-propelled torpedo. This success invigorated Captain Vedigan. He was resolved to be next in line. By mid-September, the submarine prowled mere miles from the Dutch coast, vigilantly scouring the horizon for potential targets. At that same time, three Royal Navy Cressy-class armored cruisers patrolled the North Sea between England and the Netherlands to keep the Germans from entering the English Channel from the east. This particular squadron was made up of armored cruisers HMS Cressy, HMS Abukir, and HMS Hogue. Surprisingly, though only 14 years into their service, these vessels had been engineered around the turn of the century. By now, their designs were seen as outdated and the machinery temperamental. Consequently, their crews largely consisted of reserve sailors on part-time duty and enthusiastic yet inexperienced naval college cadets. The setup didn't escape scrutiny. Several military stalwarts, including Winston Churchill, the First Lord of the Admiralty, voiced concerns over the squadron's evident vulnerability. The reservations were so pronounced that the fleet earned the nickname the Live Bait Squadron. Despite the prevailing reservations, Vice Admiral Sir Doveton Sturdy, Recognizing their limitations, but perhaps seeing some strategic value, insisted they remain in active service until the more modern Arethusa-class cruisers were launched. Thus, 
Against many odds, the live bait squadron remained vigilant. In the early hours of September 22, 1914, the three British armored light cruisers were sailing almost two miles away from each other. With their designated leader absent, the helm of leadership was handed to Captain John Drummond, stationed aboard Abukir. Sharing the sentiment of many of his peers in the Royal Navy, he viewed German U-boats as more of a nuisance than a genuine threat. Riding straight through the North Sea, the ships did not zigzag, as they believed that the turbulent seas a few hours earlier must have also been too rough for submarines. This would prove a fatal miscalculation. When Captain Lieutenant Otto Bettigan noticed them, he found the opportunity and victims he'd been hunting for. And at 6.30 a.m., a quiet beast struck from below. The first of U-9's torpedoes tore right into Abukir. Initially, Drummond assumed that they'd hit a mine and signaled the rest of the squadron, asking for help. When the ship shook from a massive explosion moments later, likely from right below the magazine, he ordered the other two vessels to leave, as he feared the attack had come from a U-boat. However, Captain Wilmot Nicholson, the skipper of Hogue, believed that his ship would be safe if she kept to the side of her sister ship, Abukir, and stopped only a mile away from her to launch the boats and begin rescue missions. As Hogue carefully steamed to pick up survivors, and as Abukir sank rapidly beneath the waves, Captain Bedigan fired his torpedoes once again, this time from only 300 yards away. When U-9's bows rose out of the water, the outdated guns aboard Hogue were fired on her without scoring any hits. Soon, Cressy, the third of the live bait squadron ships, also arrived to help the survivors of her fallen sisters. However, Captain Bedigan had repositioned his boat. When the German U-boat's periscope was spotted, the skipper aboard Cressy ordered his ship to make full speed in order to ram U-9. At 7.20 a.m., Bedigan fired two torpedoes at her. One missed, and the other did not cause serious damage. Closing even nearer, ten minutes later, at 7.30 a.m., Vedigan fired his sixth and last torpedo into Credi successfully. Because none of the ships even had their watertight doors sealed, by 7.55 a.m., all were underwater. Slowly, Dutch and English vessels began to arrive at the area to rescue survivors. They moved in carefully, as these civilian ships could not be sure whether or not they were in a minefield. For hours, they searched the sea for the culprit. But Vedigan, knowing the Royal Navy would soon be swarming over the area and also out of torpedoes, guided U-9, unseen beneath the waves, and headed home. In his memoir about the sinking of Abukir, Cressy, and Hogue, Otto Vedigan recalled that, quote, with her keel uppermost, she floated until the air got out from under her, and then she sank with a loud sound, as if from a creature in pain. When news of the destruction of three British cruisers by a single U-boat in only 90 minutes reached England, the nation was in disbelief. Some British news reports conveyed tales of the cruisers facing a squadron of six German U-boats, cleverly disguised with Dutch colors. More than 1,400 sailors lost their lives that day, but the loss's magnitude wasn't just in the numbers. The calculated strike revealed the vulnerabilities of an overconfident navy. The sinking of the three cruisers showed that the age of the battleship with its massive guns and size, faced a new threat from below. Naval warfare had changed forever. This event also sent a clear message to other naval powers. If the mighty British Navy could fall to a single submarine, no fleet was safe. Adaptation became a necessity. Almost overnight, U-boats emerged as significant threats to the Royal Navy, prompting the Admiralty to make changes. Older cruisers were pulled from patrol duties, and the actions of the three Royal Navy captains faced scrutiny for not taking sufficient anti-submarine measures. While some blamed Drummond for not zigzagging and the other captains for stopping to help, some admirals felt they faced an impossible situation, caught in waters filled with drowning men. From then on, Royal Navy armored ships were ordered to zigzag, maintain at least 13 knots, and never stop in waters where enemy submarines might be lurking. Commander Dudley Pound, a future First Sea Lord, noted in his September 24th journal entry, quote, Much as one regrets the loss of life, one cannot help thinking it is a useful warning to us. We had almost begun to consider the German submarines as no good. Our awakening, which had to come sooner or later, might have come with the loss of some of our battle fleet. Back in Germany, the mood was very different, and the story was no secret. In just over an hour, SMU-9 had engaged and sunk three armored cruisers, a feat previously thought impossible. 
The crew's earlier success in reloading torpedoes while submerged had allowed them to use all their torpedoes during this engagement. Thus, Captain Lieutenant Otto Vedigan and his crew returned to a hero's welcome. Vedigan got married the day before his mission and became the most celebrated submarine captain of all the seas. The Kaiser awarded Vedigan the Iron Cross first class, and each crew member received the Iron Cross second class. Just three weeks later, on October 15, 1914, U-9, still under Vedigan's command, sank another cruiser, HMS Hawk. After this success, Captain Vedigan received the military's top award, the Port La Marite, and took command of another U-boat, U-29. Tragically, on March 18, 1915, the battleship HMS Dreadnought rammed U-29, breaking it in two in Pentland Firth. Otto and his crew perished. Interestingly, Dreadnought, the battleship that had sparked a significant arms race leading to World War I, in its only combat action, became the only battleship to sink a submarine. As for U-9, she operated in open waters for just over a year before being relegated to training duties in 1916. By the end of her tenure, she had sunk a total of 13 ships, amounting to over 26,000 tons. Germany constructed about 360 U-boats during World War I, but it remains unknown how many actually fought. Boats of the type are credited with sinking over 5,000 ships during the conflict, including both military and merchant vessels, amassing a tonnage of 13 million tons. The unrestricted German submarine warfare campaign, particularly the operations in 1917, severely disrupted the Allies' shipping lanes. This blockade threatened to starve the United Kingdom, which relied heavily on importation and forced top war planners to come up with countermeasures. This wild streak of terror, where U-boats targeted all kinds of ships without warning, was also one of the factors that led to the United States entering the war on the side of the Allies. Of the U-boats built, Germany lost 178 of them due to various reasons, including combat with enemy ships, mines, mechanical failures, and accidents. When the November 1918 armistice ended World War I, most of the old Imperial German Navy was scuttled. The subsequent Treaty of Versailles of 1919 only further limited the surface navy of Germany. To compensate, in the coming years, Germany's new navy, the Kriegsmarine, built the largest submarine fleet going into World War II. This type of submarine would become a major component of the vicious Battle of the Atlantic. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who witnessed firsthand the destructive consequences of submarine warfare, later wrote, quote, The only thing that really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. <laughs>